Hi everyone, my name is Kate Ingersoll and I'm a writer and novelist from Toledo, Ohio. Uh, in 2015, I wrote a novel called The Lace Makers and I described the early process of that, uh, of that book in a, an earlier video, which I'll put a link below so you can go back and, and watch that if you're interested in learning a little bit more about how the initial idea of the lace makers came to me. Uh, but I spent about a year to a year and a half researching, reading books, watching films, uh, looking at documentaries to give me more of a, a more full picture of the Civil War and of the Holocaust. And what I specifically was looking for were personalized accounts. Um, I looked for autobiographies wherever I could find them. And after I had started writing Emerald's story, Emerald is the eight-year-old uh, girl living in slavery in Tennessee. Um, after I had written her initial chapter, I discovered 12 Years a Slave. And many of you may have watched the film uh, or even read the book. And it's a harrowing story about Solomon Northrup, who was born a freeman, but um, I believe it was 18, yes, 1841, he was captured and was enslaved for 12 years, unlawfully, of course. Um, and that story in and of itself was so harrowing to me. There were scenes in that film that I will never be able to unsee. And I know that they only skim the surface of the millions and millions and millions and millions of acts of cruelty that happened during slavery before that and after that. In light of the George Floyd murder in May, in light of all the police brutality that we are seeing, we can, we can see even now that the mindset of racism is still prevalent. The part that I'm gonna be reading today from 12 Years a Slave, I think is very poignant. It, it takes place very shortly after he is imprisoned as a slave and how he kept insisting to his owner um, that he was a free man and he was beaten for it. So I'm going to be reading parts of that to you now. Um, this is pretty intense. So if you're very sensitive to, to violence or to man's inhumanity to man, you may just want to skip, skip this video. But I found that this was very difficult to read, very difficult to witness. And uh, for any of us that that seek to find understanding, to seek understanding of the past. This is one of the best ways to know what really happened through the, through the words of someone who actually experienced it. So his owner um, was named Birch. And ironically enough, after I'd written Emerald's initial chapter, there is a slave owner that is horrible in, um, in her area, not her master but in the area where she was in Lincoln County and his name was Birch actually so it's, it's a serendipity that, that this slave owner was also named Birch. So he goes to Solomon who's been incarcerated after he's been um, thrown into this pen and sometime later he comes to see him. Well my boy how do you feel now said Birch as he entered through the open door. I replied that I was sick and inquired the cause of my imprisonment. He answered that I was his slave, that he had bought me, and that he was about to send me to New Orleans. I asserted aloud and boldly that I was a free man, a resident of Saratoga, where I had a wife and children who were also free, and that my name was Northrop. I complained bitterly of the strange treatment I had received and threatened upon my liberation to have satisfaction for the wrong. He denied that I was free, and with an emphatic oath declared that I came to Georgia, that I came from Georgia. Again and again I asserted I was no man's slave, and insisted upon his taking off my chains at once. He endeavored to hush me, as if he feared my voice would be overheard, but I would not be silent and denounce the authors of my imprisonment, whoever they might be, as unmitigated villains. Finding he could not quiet me, he called me a black liar, a runaway from Georgia, and every other profane and vulgar epithet that, that the most indecent fancy could conceive. During this time, Radburn was standing silently by. His business was to oversee this human, or rather inhuman stable, receiving slaves, 
feeding and whipping them at the rate of two shillings a head per day. Turning to him, Birch ordered the paddle and cat of nine tails to be brought in. He disappeared and in a few moments returned with these instruments of torture. The paddle, as it is termed in slave beating parlance, or at least the one with which I first became acquainted and of which I now speak, was a piece of hard wood board, 18 or 20 inches long, molded to the shape of an old fashioned pudding stick or ordinary oar. The flattened portion, which was about the size and circumference of two open hands, was bored with a small auger in numerous places. The cat was a large rope of many strands, the strands unraveled and a knot tied at the extremity of each. As soon as these formidable whips appeared, I was seized by both of them and roughly divested of my clothing. My feet, as has been stated, were fastened to the floor. Drawing me over the bench, facing downwards, Radburn placed his heavy foot upon the fetters between my wrists, holding them painfully to the floor. With the paddle, Birch commenced beating me. Blow after blow was inflicted upon my naked body. And when his unrelenting arm grew tired, he stopped and asked if I still insisted I was a free man. I did insist upon it. And then the blows were renewed faster and more energetically, if possible, than before. When again tired, he would repeat the same question and receive the same answer and continue his cruel labor. All this time, the incarnate devil was uttering most fiendish oaths. At length, the paddle broke, leaving the useless handle in his hand. Still, I would not yield. All his brutal blows could not force from my lips the foul lie that I was a slave. Casting madly on the floor the handle of the, paddle, of the broken paddle, he seized the rope. This was far more painful than the other. I struggled with all my power but it was in vain. I prayed for mercy, but my prayer was only answered with imprecautions and with stripes. I thought I must die beneath the lashes of the accursed brute. Even now the flesh crawls upon my bones as I recall the scene. I was all on fire. My sufferings I can compare to nothing else than the burning agonies of hell. At last I became silent to his repeated questions. I would make no reply. In fact, I was becoming almost unable to speak. Still, he plied the lash without stint upon my poor body until it seemed that the lacerated flesh was stripped from my bones at every stroke. A man with a particle of mercy in his soul would not have beaten even a dog so cruelly. At length, Rathburn said that it was useless to whip me any more that I would be sore enough. Thereupon, Birch desisted, saying with an, admoni with an admonitory shake of his fist in my face and hissing the words through his firm set teeth that if I ever dared to utter again that I was entitled to my freedom, that I had been kidnapped or anything whatever of the kind, the castigation I had just received was nothing in comparison that would follow. He swore that he would either conquer or kill me. With these consolatory words, the fetters were taken from my wrists, my feet still remained fastened to the ring, the shutter of the little barred window, which had been open, was again closed, and going out, locking the great door behind them, I was left in darkness as before. In an hour, perhaps two, my heart leapt to my throat as the key rattled in the door again. I, who had been so lonely, and who had longed so ardently to see someone, I cared not who, now shuddered at the thought of the man's approach. A human face was fearful to me, especially a white one. Radburn entered, bringing with him on a tin plate a piece of shriveled, shriveled fried pork, a slice of bread, and a cup of water. He asked me how I felt and remarked that I had received a pretty severe flogging. He, remon he remonstrated with me against the propriety of asserting my freedom. In rather a patronizing and confidential manner, he gave it to me as his advice that the less I said on the subject, the better it would be for me. The man evidently endeavored to appear kind, whether touched at the sight of my sad condition 
or with the view of silencing on my part any further expression of my rights, it is not necessary now to conjecture. He unlocked the fetters from my ankles, opened the shutters of the little window, and departed, leaving me alone again. By this time, I had become stiff and sore. My body was covered with blisters, and it was with great pain and difficulty that I could move. From the window, I could observe nothing but the roof resting on the adjacent wall. At night, I lay down upon the damp, hard floor without any pillow or covering whatever. Punctually, twice a day, Radburn came in with his fork and bread and water. I had but little appetite, though I was tormented with continual thirst. My wounds would not permit me to remain but a few minutes in any one position, so sitting or standing or moving slowly around, I passed the days and nights. I was heartsick and discouraged. Thoughts of my family, of my wife and children, continually occupied my mind. When sleep overpowered me, I dreamed of them, dreamed I was again in Saratoga, that I would see their faces and hear their voices calling me. Awakened from the, pleasant, the pleasant phantasms of sleep to the bitter realities around me, I could but groan and weep. Still, my spirit was not broken. I indulged the anticipation of escape, and that speedily. It was impossible, I reasoned, that men could be so unjust as to detain me as a slave when the truth of my case was known. Birch, ascertaining I was no runaway from Georgia, would certainly let me go. Though suspicions of Brown and Hamilton were not infrequent, those were the men they captured. I could not reconcile myself to the idea that they were instrumental to my imprisonment. Surely they would seek me out. They would deliver me from thraldom. Alas, I had not then learned the measure of man's inhumanity to man, nor to what limitless extent of wickedness he will go for the love of gain. I, I can't tell you how harrowing it has been to revisit the, the research, I have pages and pages and pages of man's inhumanity to man documented. But if nothing else, if we can talk about these things now, if we can bring history to light and see that we do have a long history in this country, but in many times a very short memory, if we can remember the stories of the past, if we can explain to ourselves and to others the evolution of man and our awareness of our interconnectedness with each other, we can begin to heal. So I look forward to sharing more research with you, more books with you in the weeks to come before I release The Lace Makers. It will be available on Amazon in digital and paperback forms on June 21st. Um, please feel free to leave comments, to like or share this video, and let me know your thoughts. I look forward to hearing from you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.